Bonsoir. Uh, good evening. So um, I'm going to say this in English since this talk was announced um, as an English language talk. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome you and our speaker, Pisin Chen, uh, Professor Pisin Chen, um, here at the IAP in a, a public lecture that's been organized by the Lagrange Institute of Paris, the ILP. Um, let me just uh, say a few words about uh, our speaker. He um, obtained his PhD from UCLA in theoretical particle physics and uh, has been named uh, APS Fellow, the Fellow of the American Physical Society in 1994. Um, he has uh, received special recognition as a contributor um, to the uh, Gravity Research um, uh, Foundation essay competition and um, uh, has uh, published numerous papers in, um, on the nature of dark energy and dark matter. Um, in 2007, he joined uh, NTU uh, in Taiwan and has uh, been um, CC Lung Chair of Cosmology there and is the director of the Lung uh, Center for Cosmology and Particle Astrophysics, or LOCOSPA. Um, and tonight he will tell us about um, why Hawking always lost his bets. Professor Chen. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yes. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> this is, um, I've been giving popular science talks elsewhere, but this is the first time in Paris, in France. And uh, let me give it a try. Uh, if uh, my uh, material is too much, uh, too long, uh, I'll cut at any, any time when you're tired. Um, so, but the target is one hour. Um, so, uh, you perhaps have heard that Hawking uh, has, has made bets with various different colleagues over his life. Uh, and not sure if you have heard that essentially he lost most of all these bets. So it became my curiosity uh, whether there's a reason for it. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not, uh, a, you know, expert in Gamble's game theories. I, I, I'm not able to uh, provide you any scientific analysis. So what I most can do is uh, just tell you the, the story, the history of the various bets and um, what's the physics content of those bets. Uh, hopefully at the end <coughs> of this one hour, uh, we can uh, draw some conclusions by ourselves. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a, a going to be a consensus. All right, so without much further ado, uh, let me uh, just make a, make a list of uh, what I know uh, about uh, his various beds. Uh, here, it's a list of six beds. Uh, you perhaps know some that I, did, uh, that I don't, I didn't. And so please uh, point it out to me. Well, the words are a bit small. I, uh, yeah. Is it uh, legible? Yeah. So um, the, the, the earliest I know of is a, uh, was a bet between uh, Kip Thorne and Hawking. This, uh, this was in 1974. And uh, <clears throat> then his uh, postdoc, Don Page. Oh, OK. Yeah. Let me still try with this. And then if I failed, I use that. Um, I think this was 1980, and the, uh, so I will go through one by one. Um, the next one was a <coughs> three-party bet, uh, Presgill, Thorne, Hawking, uh, two-sided uh, against Hawking, and the, uh, the fourth one that I list here is a Thorne, Hawking, Presgill bet, this time Thorne uh, sided with Hawking against Presgill. Then uh, the next one was uh, Hawking's bet against uh, Gordy Kane. And the last one is uh, Hawking Turok bet. This one was the, uh, yeah, actually the last two were uh, dated 2002. So uh, just for the fun of it, let's go through it. The, um, the first bet, the Thorn Hawking bet, um, <clears throat> 
essentially is the following. They, uh, uh, they, 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 they argue uh, about whether uh, Cygnus X1 uh, discovered, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, it's, uh, the signals were discovered at, uh, <coughs> during that time, and uh, it smells like uh, something emitted from a black hole. And so the bet was, um, uh, well, let me see. Yes, the, uh, the bet was Hawking believes uh, that Cygnus X1 is not a black hole, whereas Thorne believes that uh, the opposite. And the, uh, the, the wager is that Hawking uh, would subscribe one year of the uh, Penthouse magazine to Thorne. Uh, in reverse, Thorne would uh, describe four years of uh, the detective magazine to Hawking. The result was that uh, Hawking conceded in 1988. Uh, but um, as we know about Hawking, uh, he, he doesn't just kind of concede simply. He said, I have conceded the bet. I paid the specific penalty, which was the, a one-year subscription of Penthouse, to the outrage of Kip's liberated wife. So, <clears throat> um, some of you may know Kip Thorne personally, and perhaps his family. So, this was uh, what, uh, what Hawking says. Now, what's this Cigna X1? This is a... <clears throat> um, Cygnus, of course, as we know, is a, it's a, you know, it's a uh, constellation in uh, Greek uh, mythology, and we know, uh, many of us know the, the detailed stories, and let me not go through. And so what happened was that uh, eventually it was decided that this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, signal that was about 700 light years away, uh, uh, the, uh, it was indeed a, a stellar-sized black hole uh, that is accreting a uh, blue star and the accretion of, uh, you know, into the, you know, the uh, material into the accretion disk was spitting out uh, as jets uh, along the, the axis. So uh, I think <clears throat> eventually it was clearly decided, and uh, so uh, I think Hawking really has no choice. So this is a ra ra relatively simple uh, uh, verdict, uh, shall we say, because uh, it's, a, it's just a very clear defi clearly defined thing. Um, but I do have a, I do have a, a kind of re reflection on this. I think Hawking is really a very smart guy. He bet it, I think, even if he really actually th uh, believed that Cygnus was indeed a black hole, he bet it against it. So there's nothing for him to lose. If he was, if he won, then of course he won, right? And uh, but if he lost, he, you know, it proves that his since, you know, he's been working on black holes and you know, there's an actual black hole in the in the sky. So uh, I thought that he was smart to bet against Sigma X1 being a black hole. All right, now the uh, the Page Hawking bet. Now. <clears throat> Uh, Page bets to Hawking that uh, the, uh, the uh, one pound uh, uh, sterling, that quantum gravity uh, is uh, predictable, namely uh, strong cosmic censorship holds, and initial pure state, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, will have a unique S matrix uh, evolution to a pure final state. Now, Hawking bet, bets to uh, uh, page one U.S. dollar. Um, now that such a pure initial state will, in general, evolve through S, S matrix into a mixed final state. So this is uh, quite a uh, technical uh, statement. Um, essentially, uh, Hawking was betting that the uh, the information uh, it will indeed uh, be lost uh, through the. Uh, his famous uh, black hole radiation or evaporation. Now, um, the, uh, in the year 2004, uh, uh, Hawking uh, conceded and gave uh, Don a $1 US, one US dollar bill. Um, let me 
show you the, the picture. This was provided to me by Don. Um, now, um, <laughs> you're, you're laughing at this statement here? Yeah, yeah no, well, that's just like the other one, right? He was, uh, you know, even, even when he conceded, he, he must say something, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but actually, he's trickier than that. Uh, too bad that this photo, photo uh, the resolution of it was not that good. So, you know, I was very tempted to uh, blow it up more, but uh, if I did that, it's not going to be, uh, it's going to be very fuzzy. So let me describe to you, uh, which is kind of fun. Actually, at the center of this US dollar bill, it was not George Washington. It's Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> nah. So you cannot even use that one dollar bill. Uh, and, uh, you know, Don Page, of course, would not use it. That probably framed me, up, framed me up. So no wonder, you know, Stephen Hawking was uh, kind of smiling like that. So he likes to play tricks. Um, now, <clears throat> this following was also uh, provided to me by Don, uh, their handwriting uh, bit, uh, even with the, with the fingerprint. Now, uh, I will actually come back to this, uh, to this theme more uh, in the rest of, our, of this uh, lecture. Now, there's the, uh, okay, the next one's the Preskill Thorn Hawking bit. Uh, here, the, uh, as I just said, Preskill and Thorn believe that the uh, naked singularities can uh, exist, while uh, Hawking, Hawking believes that uh, the opposite. So this bet was made in 1991, and uh, the bet was on uh, one uh, copy of uh, Encyclopedia of Baseball. Now, uh, the result is that Hawking conceded in 1997, but he complained that the original bet was not well defined or well uh, post posted. And so, under agreement, the, uh, the bet was revised, and with the revision, the bet was reopened. Um, now, unfortunately, I think there was no uh, conclusion or uh, you know, decision made until uh, the time of Hawking's death in 2018. So this one uh, is kind of an open-ended thing. The, uh, uh, the old bet was uh, somewhat more civilized. It was an encyclopedia of baseball. The, uh, the new bet and they, uh, for this revised version was a clothing to cover the winner's nakedness. Uh, that's a, I think that's kind of nice. So, um, all right, here's the photos of the three gentlemen. And uh, I even suspect that this was, uh, this was the uh, uh, Hawking's, uh, you know, uh, you know, his, uh, he conceded, oh, it's this picture. So Hawking did concede in 2004, and uh, I think that looks like a uh, uh, co copy of Encyclopedia of Baseball. Um, so this uh, is not very legible, but this was the original bet with uh, fingerprints and so on. Now, so let me, since uh, I'm Thank you for asking. So uh, general relativity predicts uh, the existence of space-time singularity for sure. Now, uh, uh, actually, you know, I took this from, uh, from Google, but uh, once when I gave a popular science talk, I, uh, I showed it such a uh, figure. At the end, a lady asked me, um, now, uh, so in, in the universe, in space, so do you actually see these horn-like things, uh, the black holes? And then I re realized uh, the, uh, the cultural gap. You know, we are so used to have, um, to, to plot something uh, where one of the x's is the function of the rest, uh, say f of x versus x, et cetera. Now, but, uh, but indeed this original figure was misleading in that it just simply put x, y, z. Actually, that z is, isn't the, the third dim spatial dimension. It's the, it's the curvature of space-time that you are, we are plotting against x, y. 
So no wonder she thought that it was like a, like a trumpet or like a horn. But that's not, okay. So that Z direction is, 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 uh, is just some mathematics. It's uh, the horizontal, the, the XY uh, is the real uh, space in this plot. And uh, so-called singularity is when your curvature goes to infinity. Or, uh, so that's kind of the idea. And uh, as, uh, as we just now was, we were talking about, there's the uh, uh, horizon surrounding this, uh, this singularity where uh, not, uh, material, not, not even light, can come out. And, and uh, it is also well known that uh, Penrose and Hawking has uh, you know, uh, put forward famous theorems called the singularity theorems. And so, uh, so these are, uh, math can be mathematically proven that uh, singularities uh, are the necessary consequence of general relativity. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's singularity. Now, uh, so this was what, uh, Roger Penrose said, um, or, or proposed, there's uh, this conjecture that uh, there's uh, the nature uh, forbids naked singularity, and that was part of the bit. Um, apologize for this page I took from uh, the internet. It's not very clear, but uh, uh, what uh, I can say here is that um, <coughs> mathematicians were indeed able to to show that uh, uh, singularities can exist as, uh, you know, uh, uh, but uh, however, physicists tend not to like uh, naked singularities. And so this, this censorship uh, is still yet to be tested. And even more recently, there are papers discussing about uh, testing the cosmic censorship. So I hope it's fair to say that this is still not a uh, firm uh, resolution yet. Now, uh, the next one. Thorne, Hawking, Preskill bet this time. Thorne and Hawking uh, cited, oh, you know, cited together, believe that the black hole Hawking evaporation indicates that the quantum field theory should be modified. Whereas Preskill, uh, he being a particle theorists believe that the opposite, that is that, the, uh, that general relativity is really uh, the one that should be modified. This bet uh, was made in 1997. Um, I failed to find out uh, what was actually the bet, if you do know. Uh, the result, uh, again, I mean, in, this is a rather pivotal year. Uh, somehow Hawking in that year decided uh, the uh, to cite it with quantum field theory instead of general relativity. And uh, so this is this uh, together with uh, his bet with, uh, against Don Page. Let's move on with uh, the next bet. So this is a, uh, Hawking's bet against Gordy Kane. Now, um, so the bet was that Hawking uh, believes that the, uh, the uh, LHC uh, will not find the Higgs particle. Uh, Kane, of course believe the opposite. So this bet was made 202, and um, the, the, uh, the wager was uh, 100 US dollar. Yeah, this is, time, this is more, huh? more than the one dollar bill. Now, uh, uh, this one is easy. It's found, <laughs> so, so Hawking lost. Now, um, uh, just for those who are not familiar with, uh, with the particle physics, this is a photo of uh, the uh, LHC Collider at CERN, and uh, that's the first eye view. Uh, there's actually, you cannot see anything like a ring up, uh, above ground. That's just an uh, artist drawing there. Okay, it's underground. So this is one of the detectors, and uh, yeah, the so-called the God part particle was indeed found, and uh, uh, with, with now uh, with the symbol H, uh, which is responsible for giving masses to the elementary particles. 
Now, uh, so this bit, I think, is relatively trivial. Um, now, to me, a relatively non-trivial one is this one, uh, Hawking bet, bet with uh, Neil Turok. Now, the bet was made 203. Again, I failed to find out what was the uh, wager. Um, now, let's talk about the result. This is a rather lengthy result uh, because it is indeed <laughs> not very clear cut. So, um, when BICEP2 announced uh, the, uh, the false discovery, let's say, of the primordial gravitational waves in 2013, I think, 13, 12, 13? I think it's 13. Um, so, Hawking, huh? Later, I think. Later? 14? Yeah, because I mean. 14, 15? 15? All right, sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, this afternoon in a rush, I, a public, yeah, I didn't bother to check. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, now I think at that moment, Hawking uh, jumped the gun. I think uh, thought he won the bet finally for the first time or what? Um, uh, I'll, I'll explain to you why. Why so? I mean, what's that? You know, bicep two results uh, having to do with uh, with uh, with this? Bit. Um, oh, I, I didn't. Did I describe the bit? No, I didn't. No wonder. Okay, so I should have typed out some, some words in, in white to, to describe the bit. Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, this is a little bit jumping across. I have. I, I think I should show the next page. The ah, okay. But but this this will just do the job. So um, what happens is that. Um, Turok and Steinhardt um, are, uh, you know, kind of uh, are proponents uh, for this, uh, uh, what's called the cyclic universe, uh, shall we say model or theory. The, um, so the idea is that this universe just, uh, you know, uh, think of it as brains and so on, keep colliding, and, uh, and uh, so the, uh, the universe uh, has has its uh, you know past lives and also future lives, and uh, so the cyclic universe uh, principle will expand and contract uh, and on and on, and so your your what's called a minus a, a plus. So your universe, if let's say this is our current universe, and uh, we now see. Uh, the late time universe, uh, which is accelerated expansion, and uh, but uh, uh, the uh, according to the theory, it will eventually uh, it, this kind of turns around and then will bounce and then bang again and so on. But uh, it's not a pure repeat. This thing is not going horizontally; it's uh, it's gradually kind of increasing. So this was. A means a uh, scale factor, the size of, yeah. Now, so after these two pages, I can turn back. So, so uh, Hawking uh, bets against this notion of cyclic universe. Um, and so what has that to do with, so let's come back here. Now, um, so all right, so now we understand what's the bit. And so in the year 2000, 2015, thank you for the correction, the, uh, so he thought he won. Uh, but uh, as we, you know, many of us in this room know, uh, soon after it was found that the, the, uh, the BICEP 2's uh, finding was a false alarm and the bet was inconclusive. And now let me explain to you the connections. Why, uh, what's BICEP 2? What's, what, what, what did it measure, and why is it relating to this bet? All right, so this is a, uh, now I think uh, I should uh, move around the picture a little bit. It's not V, huh? that's an R, uh, Y, uh, history. So a brief history of the universe goes like this. You have a Big Bang, and uh, at the very beginning, uh, it underwent uh, a, you know, very uh, uh, rapid expansion within a 
tiny uh, split of a second, the universe expanded, uh, uh, you know, 30 orders of magnitude in size and so, so, so on, before it settled, settled down and started uh, this, what we're familiar with, uh, the, uh, the Hubble expansion. And uh, at first, it, uh, the expansion was gradually slowing down uh, due to the contribution of uh, dark matter. Uh, and at that, uh, you know, but until about 50 billion years, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, five billion years ago, the universe has, uh, um, uh, has entered a new era, uh, a new, uh, new phase where now dark energy dominates and these universe, uh, the universe became, uh, it's you know, accelerating its expansion. And uh, so it's symbolized by the, by the curvature here of this horn. Uh, so uh, once again, I uh, need to explain, this is, our universe doesn't look like a horn. Uh, so it's just, uh, th this, this represents the, uh, the time of uh, universe ev uh, evolution. And uh, since we are limited with our, with our um, you know, two-dimensional papers uh, perspective, uh, we can only do this much. So imagine uh, ourselves, our universe uh, lives on, this, uh, on the surface of this horn. Okay. Um, now, this is, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 at the beginning, this universe is extremely hot, and this, uh, uh, when doing this inflation, the quantum mechanics uh, dictates that it, 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 it undergoes some fluctuations. And those fluctuations result in uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, it's kind of a, the uh, uh, the seeding of all the uh, 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 you know structures uh, in the late time universe. Now, uh, what happens is that uh, during that inflation, not only uh, the uh, the uh, temperature can uh, can uh, uh, undergo some fluctuations, uh, and we call it uh, the uh, the uh, scalar fluctuation, uh, the, uh, the space-time structure uh, also uh, subject, are also subject to fluctuations, and those, uh, the, uh, the grids of space-time uh, is also, you know, uh, <coughs> doing some quantum uh, uh, fluctuations, and this uh, is uh, uh, the uh, origin of what we call gravitational waves. And since it's at the very beginning of the universe, uh, we call it the primordial gravitational wave. Now, this primordial gravitational waves can, in principle, <coughs> register its influence onto this uh, uh, density or temperature fluctuations that we have often seen. Uh, this is a build, you know, nice drawing. But we have, uh, in 1992, uh, George Smoot and company uh, the COBE satellite first managed to measure the, uh, the uh, density fluctuation or temperature fluctuations in at the, shall we say, an isotropy of, of the, of, uh, <coughs> of the uh, uh, you, you know, micro, microwave background. Now, <coughs> so uh, what we're trying to say here is that <coughs> On top of that uh, density fluctuations, you can also have the space-time grid uh, that, is uh, that, uh, that is also fluctuating. And uh, those uh, space-time fluctuations give rise to uh, gravitational waves, as I've already said. Now, um, it uh, <coughs> can, in principle, register this space-time, uh, the, uh, the gravitational fluctuation, uh, gravitational wave fluctuations. Uh, on the uh, <coughs> on the density uh, fluctuations, the, uh, so it registers itself on the uh, the CMB map, and the uh, the signature uh, of that uh, is uh, <coughs> is that you if you manage to in addition to measure the uh, CMB uh, 
uh, density fluctuations or, or temperature fluctuations. Uh, in addition, if you are able also to measure its polarization, say E fields and so on, <coughs> then uh, and you you uh, plot the fluctuations, uh, the, the 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 polarizations, and if you happen to find uh, patterns like this or that, uh, we call that B mode. Then that's uh, a unmistakable signature uh, of the uh, the fluctuation of the geometry, not just the you know temp not just the, the temperature during the inflation, but just the space time grid is also fluctuating, and that is uh, 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 that that is what we call the, the uh, primordial gravitational waves. Now. Uh, so specifically, one can imagine this type of patterns. Uh, these, are, these, these are made up by uh, computer simulations. And uh, <clears throat> so what eventually people will measure is something uh, like swirls. And uh, so BICEP2, uh, which is located, it's, an, it's the telescope, and located at South Pole. Um, uh, <clears throat> was one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, telescopes that uh, uh, aim at discovering such primordial gravitational waves, and uh, this was the announcement. Uh, this this photo was taken during their announcement. Uh, I I think it's 2015, and but as I said, it's a false alarm. In fact, I think Van Gogh had already observed that. So, yeah, the BMO in the sky. Now, so so much for uh, uh, okay. So why did why did Hawking think that this would be uh, would be a uh, a, a support uh, to his bet against the Turok? Uh, I think that's because if uh, if um, uh, well. You know, I, I I cannot speak for him, but uh, I was thinking the uh, uh, the the, uh, the uh, primordial in in the Turok Steinhardt theory, they uh, they did not have the notion of inflation. Um, some of you in the audience may be uh, may be familiar with the theory, but they they just replaced they just 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 repeat. Uh, is able to explain what we have seen. That's uh, that's their claim. All right. So uh, now, however, if you do see uh, the uh, uh, what we call tensor mode, the gravitational primordial gravitational wave, as the additional signatures, then uh, uh, that should be a hard evidence that indeed there is the uh, inflation, because. Uh, the uh, cyclic universe was not able to reproduce this part. Okay, so um, unfortunately, up to now, this is uh, still not undetermined, and hopefully, in a few more years, uh, where we can decide whether is there is indeed. Uh, well, uh, for, to the to the experts in the room, um, the, uh, the the uh, the R ratio, so called. It's the ratio between the tensor mode uh, and the uh, scalar mode, the gravitational, primordial gravitational wave strength versus the density perturbations. Um, it's uh, model dependent. Some uh, predicted a very small ratio, like 0 0.01, uh, and some predict uh, some bigger. So, uh, so this actually is a very nice tool. Uh, perhaps the uh, the last holy grail of uh, CMB measurements uh, to uh, hopefully bring uh, bring down, shall we say, uh, some of the contending models and surviving some of the others, and so as to make this uh, inflation a more uh, more of a uh, uh, have has uh, ha to ha to make it uh, how shall I say more uh, of a precise. The uh, Physics and to know exactly who, uh, what's the physics behind. Now, uh, okay. Well, I just like to say that uh, not just Stephen Hawking 
Um, Einstein also uh, enjoyed betting, I think. Um, there's this famous uh, debate between him and Niels Bohr. Um, and we often heard this, these words, God does not play dice. Uh, but Bohr, uh, in response, say, don't tell God uh, what to do. Now, uh, but, but Einstein, being Einstein, he's just always unique. He doesn't just stop there. He didn't stop there. Now, so he went, uh, apparently this debate was uh, 1927, I think. Um, so, you know, at times he was very, uh, was, was very uh, uh, pleased and bored, was kind of uh, looked upset. But at other times, uh, Bohr, you know, maybe overnight, Bohr uh, provided another counter-argument. So uh, clearly, uh, Einstein didn't win the debate during the time, but uh, he kept thinking about so by 1935, it, uh, he uh, put forward this uh, uh, paradox or, or conjecture, uh, so-called EPR conjecture, um, trying to um, uh, devise uh, an experiment that can uh, prove that this, uh, this, uh, quant the basic notion of quantum mechanics and uh, non-locality uh, is, is uh, has, has problem. And uh, as we also heard, in 1960, John Bell uh, uh, devised a, uh, to, to uh, turn this uh, uh, EPR paradox into a uh, more precise mathematical form. And by, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, now we call this the Bell's inequality. And, uh, and so, indeed, um, Alan Aspect uh, of, uh, of Orsay, uh, who, who first showed us, uh, uh, proved this Bell's inequality, namely Einstein was wrong. Uh, well, he was a PhD student, I think, yeah. Uh, so uh, this was wonderful, 1980 something, yeah. Um, now, uh, talking about John Bell, uh, he's a close friend of my. PhD advisor J.J. Sakurai. So uh, I succeeded my professor to become his good friend too. And uh, so this is a photo which I treasure. Uh, this is one of, this is beef, oh, this is in the year 1990. So he and his wife Mary uh, visited, uh, came back to St Stanford Slack, uh, where I uh, used to work. The, um, actually his, uh, Famous inequality was uh, published while he was uh, uh, he was uh, at Slack, and uh, that little that little girl was my is my daughter, and uh, so that was good old days. He passed away too soon. I think he deserves the Nobel Prize together with Ellen Aspect. Now, um, so uh, talking about resolutions. Oh, it, our time's running out, so I, I think I've been uh, dragging too much. So, um, all right, so just a few words. Let's see if I can accelerate myself. Um, so we all heard uh, Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat, and this, this is trying to, uh, it's a, trying to ridicule the, uh, the uh, superposition uh, notion uh, in quantum mechanics. A cat can be either alive or, de or dead, uh, but it's a superposition of, of both. And without uh, taking a probe, uh, you're, you will have a cat which is either alive or, or, de or, or dead. And this was, um, uh, for over many years, I, 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 I think many of us just associate this idea with uh, Schrodinger because he actually he wrote it into a paper. Um, before I uh, realized a few years ago that uh, the idea, the original idea, was provided to him by Einstein in, during, in their, in one, in their uh, frequent uh, letter communications. Yeah. But Einstein was not necessarily a cat lover, I think, because in Einstein's original Gedanken experiment, there was no cat. And this cat, indeed, was uh, Schrodinger's invention. Now. Um, 
born, born out of that, uh, the, um, the uh, EPR paradox, et cetera, uh, the, um, the one very important additional contribution by uh, Schrodinger was uh, the concept of uh, quantum entanglement, which uh, after so many decades, uh, yeah, eight dec decades or so, is now finally uh, becoming a uh, very, very hard topic uh, involving quantum computing, quantum uh, encryptology, and so on, uh, communications, etc. So what Schrodinger said is that quantum entanglement, is not, and I'll explain to you in one minute what quantum entanglement is, but uh, uh, I thought this is some, uh, some interesting statement that uh, uh, strikes me. Schrodinger said uh, quantum entanglement is not uh, just a characteristic of quantum mechanics. It is the characteristic of quantum mechanics. So it's being elevated to that level. And uh, so let's keep in mind. So what, what, what exactly are we talking about? You, um, since, since quantum mechanics is uh, non-local, uh, wave functions are non-local, uh, this was already... Uh, you know, and, and actually it has physical effects. We, we've been talking about EPR paradox, Bell's inequality, etc. Now, um, so if, well, when in any uh, physical system that we consider, usually in the lab or some boxes or somewhere, and in you, you are, when you do so, you're dividing this universe into two, two pieces. Let's call it subsystem system A and B. The rest of the universe is B, and your, your, your system is A. But the quantum non-locality tells you that these two, two subsystems of the universe cannot be separately, you know, or totally isolated. They are, they are entangled. They are related. And uh, why do I jump to this one? Yeah, so let me talk about this first. Uh, for example, Vacuum is full of quantum fluctuations. Um, and uh, so for, uh, you know, for, for typical, um, uh, let's say, quantum, uh, you know, electrodynamics. So the vacuum can jump up, jump out temporarily with uh, electron-positron pairs, etc. Now, um, but they like to go in pairs, so uh, that's why uh, we use the word monogamy. Now, uh, so this is one husband, one wife system. Imagine you have uh, this two system, A in gray, and system B, the rest of the universe. And you can imagine that your quantum fluctuations can have various different type of combinations, uh, either with both inside uh, system A or both outside uh, in system B, or one in each, each side, etc. But uh, always uh, they are one to one. Now, uh, so imagine that you have some knowledge about, uh, let, let's say, uh, say this pair. If you manage to measure something here, this, this white thing, then uh, you, you are able to infer that, uh, some properties of that, that black one. It's companion. And, these, and that's what we call entanglement. Now, um, so uh, what Schrodinger is trying to say is that uh, quantum uh, entanglement gives you a new type of entropy. It, tells, uh, it measures how entangled the, the system is. Uh, this is in contrast to the, uh, uh, the conventional thermodynamics, where uh, we uh, talk about entropy, which uh, measures how disordered a system is. And uh, so this is what we mean by thermal entropy. You, uh, uh, when you look at, uh, sorry, when you uh, deal with a, with an egg, and uh, so uh, when you see a, an egg that's already broken, and you tend to believe that that is a that is a, uh, that is a consequence of uh, something uh, where the uh, egg was, uh, you know, a uh, in a complete shape uh, sometime before. Uh, so you tend to believe that there is an arrow of time that uh, 
goes from a simpler system to a more, uh, more, uh, uh, more random system, and that's uh, and this randomness or disorder, uh, the measurement of that is called entropy. So, second law of thermodynamics dictates that the en any physical process, uh, the uh, the entropy would only increase instead of decrease. And well, just uh, by the way, uh, there is a parallelism between the standard thermodynamics and the black hole. There is what's called the black hole thermodynamics, which has also first, second, third, fourth laws. And the third law, the second law indeed uh, dictates that the thermal entropy of a black hole, the, the Bekenstein entropy, uh, will only increase uh, uh, in a physical process. And uh, perhaps you remember so three years ago when uh, LIGO first discovered their, discovered their first event, and the uh, reporters uh, interviewed Hawking for sure, and Hawking was saying the first thing he checked was whether the second law of black hole thermodynamics uh, holds or not. And uh, be because if you remember, it was uh, determined to be the coalescence of a uh, merger of uh, two black holes, one with 29 solar mass, the other 36. So when you add, it's uh, 65. Uh, but then, of course, uh, it was also determined that the equivalent of three solar masses uh, uh, of, uh, is turned into gravitational wave energy. So the resultant black hole has a mass of 62 solar masses. And so he wanted to check whether the second law of black hole thermodynamics uh, does hold or not. Uh, and since the uh, black hole entropy is proportional to the mass squared. And so it's an easy algebra. 29 squared plus 36 squared. And so roughly 30 squared plus, let's say, 40 squared. So it's 900 plus 1,600 is 2,500. And, uh, uh, but 60 squared is 3,600. So 3,600 is certainly bigger than 2,500. So the black hole thermal second law of thermodynamics uh, does seem to hold for classical black holes. Now, uh, my time is running out, so uh, let, me, let me quickly uh, fast forward. I wanted to share with you that um, this uh, Hawking's historical discovery about the uh, uh, black hole evaporation uh, has resulted in a, in a um, uh, tremendous debate over the last four decades about whether information uh, can be preserved uh, or in the more mathematical terms whether uh, a physical process uh, like black hole evaporation will preserve the unitarity or not. Now um, this has been under debate over the last 40 years. Uh, let me jump there too. Yeah. Um, so the issue that Hawking, uh, well, here is a layman's uh, way of look under looking at, at this issue. You have a black hole, and Hawking told us that the black hole will undergo uh, radiation. Uh, it's in the form of black body radiation, which is essentially all heat. Now, in the end, when the black hole is totally evaporated, so this initial black hole is now turning into heat. And heat doesn't contain them too much energy, uh, information. It's just totally randomness. And therefore, where has the information gone? Because at the beginning, your black hole is formed by, let's say, gravitational collapse, lots of materials, tons of information, in a sense. Where did it go? And so uh, a natural question is uh, whether uh, Hawking radiation can carry out the information after all. But that depends on. The end stage, where uh, so end stage, end stage is very critical. Uh, there's a very interesting book written by my colleague at Stanford, uh, Lenny Susskind, called "The Black Hole War." So, if in case you are interested, this is a rather entertaining book to read. Um, now, so there are possible solutions to this uh, information loss paradox. Various different conjectures. I don't uh, have the time and don't want you to. To, re to read through all that, it's just a totally partial list of, uh, of uh, 
various proposed solutions. I myself has, uh, has contributed some of them, uh, but this is definitely not the entire list. And uh, one of the uh, relatively more uh, well-known uh, solutions is proposed was proposed by um, Lenny Suskind and his co-authors uh, by the name Black Hole Complementarity. It simply says that nothing is wrong, to, nothing wrong with the uh, process as long as uh, it is consistent with its, uh, the causality within its own frame or its own uh, side of the world. Uh, specifically, what they are trying to say is that, you know, if you imagine uh, there's a, an elephant uh, that, uh, that falls into the black hole and you have two observers. Uh, let's say Alice and Bob, one on the outside, the other on the inside of this horizon. But by definition, they cannot communicate with each other because not even light can go out. And so what uh, Suskind and company says is that as long as each observer finds uh, the, uh, sees the uh, process uh, uh, um, satisfying causality within, within uh, his uh, his uh, observation. Then uh, the uh, you know there's just no way to compare notes. So this same elephant could, in principle, uh, after passing the uh, the horizon and all turn into ashes and kind of radiating out uh, its material. Uh, this as, as seen by uh, Alice, uh, but at the same time, this elephant can pass through uh, as what. General relativity predicts uh, this is uh, because event hori the horizon really is not a physical boundary. This is more like the U.S. Canada uh, boundary. Uh, so you just only see that from your 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 cell phone and you know some some maps, but uh, that you have passing uh, into a different country. Uh, but uh, but uh, but you know nothing has changed. Uh, so this is a, certainly not the uh, U.S.-Mexican boundary uh, border uh, with, with that uh, whatever wall. But uh, so, uh, so this bob on the inside may see the elephant just kind of keep going until it uh, uh, reaches its final fatal state, I mean, it, uh, to, the, uh, to the singularity. Now, um, so these, uh, but the, uh, some authors uh, argue in 2012 um, that uh, the, uh, they, they investigated and find, found that the, uh, this, uh, this uh, complementarity uh, proposal uh, was based on three uh, elements, the unitarity of physical process, local quantum field theory, and, no, uh, and the no drama. That last one is based on general relativity. And they found that these three cannot all be consistent, and one must be uh, violated, and they chose to violate the number three. Uh, they feel that that was most conservative. Uh, again, since time is very limited, let me just uh, quickly uh, jump across uh, to say that uh, uh, in 2015, uh, Don Page, myself, and Sasaki and others, we uh, showed that, um, in fact, uh, this uh, firewall conjecture uh, uh, is not so conservative uh, because if you take into consideration the back reaction of the uh, Hawking emissions, then uh, you can prove that the firewall will eventually detach from the apparent horizon of the black hole and become na naked. So people, you know, observers such as humans on Earth uh, should be able to see, the, you know, the firewall. Uh, and uh, that certainly is not very conservative. So there's, uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, the, um, uh, each and every proposal uh, very often found counter arguments and so on. So, so the jury is still out there. Now, uh, but I think even more seriously is that the, um, the uh, investigations of these, uh, this information loss paradox are, have been mostly theoretical over the last 40 years. Uh, for, I think, a good reason that is because uh, astrophysical black holes are too cold and too young, whereas the uh, resolution to this information paradox relies on, I think, the end stage of the black hole evaporation. 
And uh, for example, a stellar-sized black hole, uh, it's Hawking lifetime, so you just let it evaporate. It'll take 10 to the 67 years before such as the black hole can be totally evaporated, whereas uh, our universe by now is only 10 to the 10 years old. So in, with that standard, unless we have some primordial black holes that's uh, evaporating uh, to, towards the end until now, after 14 billion years, then we are, we're in luck. But if not, then these are, these are um, the most stellar collapsed black holes uh, will take uh, you know, eons before we are able to, um, to uh, observe anything that can uh, shed lights on this uh, information paradox. So um, that amounts to the, the, uh, the thought of um, bringing the issue back to the lab through some uh, simulated black holes or analog black holes. And one of such proposals was made um, by me and uh, Jura Muru, who was the uh, last year's uh, Nobel laureate, uh, famous for inventing this what's called CPA laser uh, scheme, which has, has revolutionized uh, the uh, laser technology in the past 30 years, 35 years. Um, so uh, together we uh, uh, propose a uh, new type of uh, analog black hole to, as a, in the form of a plasma, flying plasma mirror, uh, which shares a lot of common uh, uh, quantum physics uh, with a true black hole. Whereas a, a true black hole, uh, you know, uh, drawn on this side, it's, uh, uh, you uh, remember I talked about vacuum fluctuations in pairs and so on. Now one, if it happens to be uh, moving toward outside, uh, will be seen as, by us as uh, Hawking radiation. The other, uh, if falling into the hole, they can never find their home back and remerge into vacuum. And that's, that's the essence of how, what Hawking radiation is. A partner is just falling into and the other ones now become uh, um, all by itself, and so it's kind of moving to, to infinity. Now, um, <clears throat> but I must uh, also mention to you that um, near the, near surrounding the black hole, the, uh, the gravity is so strong that time is uh, uh, told, you know, slowing down so much, so that these partner modes, seen by us at a distance, uh, is, it's like never go across the horizon. They're like all accumulated uh, around, the, uh, uh, the, around the, the horizon. And so that's why uh, we draw it in this form. So a lot of uh, you know, bubbles there um, waiting to, uh, well, still uh, you know, trying to go in. But because of the time dilation, they're kind of accumulated there. Now, likewise, in the case of a flying mirror, the uh, uh, the mirror, indeed, similar to black hole, uh, if it, the mirror is uh, semi is infinite, it partitioned the universe into two parts, uh, two halves, and so the quantum fluctuations, even in flat space time, uh, can emit out uh, one part the particle and the other trapped to uh, the back side of the mirror. So that was the idea, and uh, since time is uh, is running out, oh, uh, this was. This was last year's Nobel ceremony, and uh, so it was uh, very touching. Um, so the, the idea of this plasma uh, mirror was based on what's called plasma wake field acceleration, who, who, the, uh, whose idea was, the idea was uh, proposed already in uh, 1979, 1985. Uh, I was uh, part of the originators, and it's been well uh, proven, the principle. Uh, currently, there's one by the acronym AWAKE uh, carrying on in CERN, and uh, based on the, uh, my type of mechanism. So simply put, your, if you put, uh, shoot a laser pulse or high energy particle beam into the plasma, it will excite some wakes behind it. And, the, uh, and if you, uh, in the nonlinear regime, it comes back almost like a, like a tsunami. All right, and uh, so if you manage to make your target uh, varying its density, the uh, 
the laser photons are traveling slower than speed of light in a material uh, can in, ten, in principle speed up if you make the target density uh, uh, more and more dilute. And so the, the, uh, this wake, or now the flying mirror trailing behind, can serve as an analog black hole. So uh, here's the conceptual design. And uh, so we are actually push, you know, pushing for a real experiment to carry out this uh, idea. Uh, first uh, in Taiwan, and then uh, eventually we want to perform uh, the experiment at uh, this new Apollon facility in the uh, Saclay Plateau, uh, which is already completed currently uh, with one petawatt. I think soon it will become 10 petawatt. So I'm really looking forward to that. Now, uh, to end this talk, I, uh, let me just, since we're talking about Hawking's bed, huh, you say, well, you know, why did I go all the way to something else? So let me show you a few photos of Hawking. And now, a brief history of him. Now, this was his childhood, uh, his adolescent age, uh, his youth at Cambridge and Oxford. And, uh, well, most of us have seen the movie, uh, the, uh, the Perfect Theory. So this is the real him. This is in the movie. It's uh, quite interesting. So let's... Uh, you know, so it remains a one wonder, why do physicists uh, like to bet? It's not just Hawking, as I tried to uh, convince you. Um, perhaps you have answers. But my answer is that many of the frontier uh, physics are conceptual, which, which is really very far beyond the uh, experimental capability of the time. And debates or bets uh, serves a very positive function. It helps to sharpen your minds uh, about very sensitive, I mean, very, uh, uh, how should I say, vague issues. And uh, whether you win or you lose, it's uh, really secondary. I think it's the help to sharpen our minds. And, uh, uh, well, the question is why, why did he always lose the bet? <laughs> okay, he should at least win half, I mean, by, just by probability. But uh, as I earlier kind of uh, commented, Perhaps he, he was intentional, just uh, since uh, you know he was uh, you know put, he has uh, put forward some theories, some things, and he always bet against that. Uh, so I, that's what I noticed. Now, uh, the, fi the very final thing, I show you a few photos of uh, my institute, just in case uh, uh, you have never heard of uh, Taiwan or National Taiwan University or. Leon Center for Cosmology and Particle Astrophysics. This is the new uh, dedicated building of our center, uh, which is just completed, but already uh, uh, recognized by several international awards, uh, architectural awards. Um, it's uh, for symmetry lovers. It's a six-fold symmetry uh, with a, a perfect square. This is a really a perfect uh, cube uh, with, uh, with circles in the middle, but this is really not painted on. This was just, this is by shaving off uh, some part of the fin. And so at different angles, you see different sides of the black hole. And uh, the, uh, this world-renowned architect by the name Chris Yao, who designed this, um, it made it look like from a distance as if there's no support. It's a floating cube uh, with a circular void. But I told him that uh, to me, it looks more like a, a dark matter uplifted by dark energy. But in any case, it's, it's floating. It looks like floating. When you walk inside, it's, uh, you, you see the vaulted ceiling going all the way to, look, you know, to the sky. And uh, there are four statues of the giants of cosmology. Here, what you see is uh, Galileo and Newton. Each one holds a, uh, an object that he uh, famously discovered or invented, uh, although Newton didn't discover apple. but. Uh, I think uh, you would forgive me, forgive me for that. Um, we just now talked about the, uh, the remnants of this uh, inflation at the beginning of the universe, which uh, cools down after 14 billion years, and by now it's uh, so cold. It's about 2.7 degree uh, Kelvin, so, uh, and, you know, negative 270 degrees C. And uh, so it was uh, finally measured 
uh, with this and, you know, anisotropy in 1992, as I said. Uh, and so in our lobby, um, it, uh, it's, uh, it's painted on the ceiling. So if you are interested um, in uh, developing further collaborations, I'm very eager to uh, invite you uh, to have a visit to Taipei. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Professor Chen, for, um, for your talk. Um, in light of the time, I think uh, we will skip the question session uh, and let everyone uh, uh, proceed. But uh, maybe you have a few minutes to stick around, and uh, then we can have informal questions for those that uh, would like to ask uh, questions directly. Yeah. So thank you for attending, and uh, watch out for further announcements uh, for upcoming talks. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you.